Yes, so welcome to today's lesson. We are going to look at uh, surgery and as usual surgery uh, you need to know how to answer questions. So we uh, last time I looked at the, the pre-op management which was acute and also in terms of an emergence uh, pre-operative care. So uh, uh, today I'll, I'll look at a question and you see how you can apply this question in answering the management for surgery that we did so this is how you should answer them and pay close at attention to the management part because you need those 50 um, uh, marks okay so the question uh, that i have reads mr isaac ingoma age six years has been brought to your surgical ward with a complaint of severe abdominal pain of sudden onset a diagnosis of acute abdomen has been made and he is scheduled for laparotomy. Question A is saying define acute abdomen. So we can define acute abdomen as this is an intra-abdominal condition of abrupt onset associated with severe abdominal pain, which can be due to inflammation, perforation, obstruction, infection, or rupture of abdominal organ requiring an emergency surgical intervention. So that is the complete definition for acute abdomen where you need to get the 5V marks that this question needed. If there are three questions, it means you just say acute abdomen is an intra-abdominal condition of abrupt onset requiring emergency surgical intervention, meaning that definition will give you three marks. But this is five marks. You need to even explain what causes the acute abdomen in that manner. Then question A2 is saying list five inflammatory causes of acute abdomen. So inflammatory causes, meaning you just need to mention those conditions which uh, leads to inflammation. So the first one that we can talk about is um, acute appendicitis. Appendicitis can result in acute abdomen, which is the inflammation of the appendix. Peritonitis, inflammation of the peritoneal cavity, pancreatitis, there is also uh, diverticulitis and also cholecystitis. So these are inflammatory causes of acute abdomen. Apart from that, we have other causes of inflammatory, uh, or for other causes of acute abdomen rather. So the other causes can be maybe mechanical causes. So examples of mechanical causes is volvulus, which is twisting of the bowels, intussusception, which is folding of a loop of bowel into itself, <clears throat> into itself. Apart from that, food bolus in the postoperative patient in abdominal surgery can be a mechanical cause of acute abdomen and also severe worm infestation such as uh, round worms and also ascariasis can cause blockage of the abdomen resulting in acute abdomen hernias can result in acute abdomen where maybe a portion of the intestine uh, protrudes into another part of the body for example maybe triangulated hernia is meaning you are going to prepare this patient for an emergency surgery also just impacted feces where there is reduced peristaltic movement and also um, constipation. There can be mechanical causes of acute abdomen. Other causes of acute abdomen are in terms of vascular causes. So examples of vascular causes of acute abdomen, you have perforated peptic ulcers, perforated diverticulitis, perforated appendix, perforated bowels and also a perforated gallbladder. So these are vascular, these are called vascular causes of acute abdomen. Then we also have traumatic causes, meaning this patient is going to be involved in injury. So in traumatic causes, there is severe physical injury to intra-abdominal organ and this, uh, this includes conditions such as uh, rupture displin, rupture ectopic pregnancy, uh, also a ruptured ovarian cyst, ruptured urinary bladder and also the ruptured appendix, meaning there is injury to this and then uh, this is called or classified as traumatic causes of acute abdomen. 
Apart from that, the other causes that we, we can uh, we can have a neoplastic. So this in neoplastic, this the acute abdomen is mainly caused by growth that is that obstructs uh, movement of food uh, into the gastrointestinal tract. So it means uh, cancer uh, cancer conditions and they impair movement of uh, food content in the GI and then those will be classified as um, neoplastic causes of acute abdomen. So this is, those are some of the causes, but this question needed only inflammatory causes, but I've also given other causes. Then question B is saying state five signs and symptoms of acute abdomen. So it's signs and symptoms of acute abdomen, and the question says is state, meaning you need to give a reason. You cannot, you cannot just say nausea and vomiting. You need to give a reason to any question we say is state or mention. So you, when you say nausea and vomiting, you will give a reason, and nausea and vomiting is due to the inflammatory process that disturbs the gastrointestinal tract functioning causing reverse peristalsis and irritation and irritating the, the nerve endings of the intestinal lining that in turn stimulates the vomiting center. Then the other sign, uh, sign and symptom is the uh, presence of signs of shock and this is due to excessive vomiting or diarrhea. There is also what we call a hardwood abdomen. So a hardwood abdomen is due to hyper excited peritoneum because of the food content that are accumulating in the peritoneum region. There's also ab uh, abdominal contours and abdominal contours are due to uh, active uh, peristaltic intestines. Then there is guarding. Guarding is due to severe pain. Then apart from that, there is uh, alteration in bowel habits. So here the patient may also experience temporary constipation and also failure to expel flutters. And this is due to uh, the irritation in the mucus lining of the gastrointestinal and this affects the peristaltic movements. Apart from that, there is complete intestinal obstruction and this is uh, seen where the patient is, is unable to pass um, feces. So inability to pass feces is due to complete intestinal obstruction. Apart from that, there is excruciating pain and excruciating pain is due to obstruction also of the abdominal uh, of the gastrointestinal tract. There is distension of the abdomen and this is due to inability to open bowels and uh, mainly also results in intestinal obstruction. There is also decreased bowel sounds and this is due to paralytic ileus. So I've given uh, almost 10 signs and symptoms, but the question only wanted five and you need to state them and give reasons just as, as I've been giving you reasons. So it is not only to this question, whenever you are taught to state, you need to give reasons to your answers. Then question C, as usual said, discuss how you will prepare Mr. Ngoma for surgery, and this is 50 marks. So on this one, you'll start with your heading to, with a small introduction to say, I will prepare Mr. Ngoma for emergency surgery because his condition has immediate life threatening. Then apart from that, uh, you, you write your next heading, which is objectives or aims. And your objectives, you have to prepare Mr. Ngoma physiologically and psychologically for emergency surgery, to resuscitate Mr. Ngoma for surgery, to relieve the pain, and also to prevent complications such as intestinal necrosis. So you need to have all four M's in that man. After your M's, now you get the headings that I gave you for pre-op management, the emergency pre-op, meaning your heading, your first heading is going to be patient, uh, a resuscitation. So here you are going to look at the airway, 
as you're first heading on resuscitation, you say, I'll assess the airway for patency and ensure that it is patent by repositioning the patient in a recumbent position with head turned to one side to promote drainage of oral secretions. From there, you move on to breathing. And on breathing, you say, I'll assess the breathing status by observing the rate and depth of respirations, checking oxygen saturation by, doing, uh, by using a pulse oximeter, and checking for presence of cyanosis. I'll therefore commence supplemental oxygen therapy by nasal catheter or mask at 5 liters per minute to improve tissue perfusion. I will also insert an NG tube to decompress the abdomen in case of uh, abdominal distension, which may interfere with breathing. This promotes full lung expansion since distension tends to push abdominal organs to the thoracic cage. So those points need to come out clearly like that on breathing. Then you move on to circulation. On circulation, you say, I will check the pulse and blood pressure to rule out shock and assess the level of dehydration by checking for skin tagger and sucking eyes for dry lips. I will quickly cannulate the patient and commence fluids intravenously in, uh, to restore intravenous volume and correct shock. I will also elevate the foot end of the bed to promote blood flow to vital organs of the body, such as the lungs, brain, and the heart. And I will cover the patient in extra linen to keep the patient warm. Then from there, your next setting is going to be pain relief. So on pain relief, you are going to say I will administer uh, pethidine, either one milligram per kg body weight or uh, either 50 to 100 milligrams eh, to block pain sensation, eh, therefore preventing neurogenic eh, shock from severe pain. Then if after pain management, you go to observation as usual. Observation, you say I will observe general condition of the patient to uh, determine the level of consciousness. I will check the vital signs, temperature, pulse, respiration, and blood pressure to monitor the condition of the patient. I will monitor the flow rate, the, the IV line to ensure that the fluid is flowing at the correct rate to improve intravenous volume. So we can talk about all those points on observation. After observation, your next heading will be investigations. So investigation, you say I will quickly collect blood for hemoglobin to, to rule out anemia, for grouping and cross match to identify the patient's blood group in case of uh, need of, for blood transfusion. To, I'll do also a random blood sugar test to rule out uh, hypoglycemia, a plain abdominal x-ray to detect causes of acute abdomen. So those uh, investigations can be done. Afterwards, you go to consent form signing. Here you just say, uh, <clears throat> you, you, you say I will give the patient uh, or his relatives to, uh, to sign the consent form so as to legalize the surgical procedure or operation. So once the patient has agreed that the surgery should be performed, uh, you, you say I will provide the consent form uh, either to the patient or the next of kin for them to sign the consent form. Okay, so after afterwards, then you move on to uh, physical preparation. So this is emergency surgery. You move on then to physical preparation. So on physical preparation, the first heading afterwards was gastric preparation. Here you say I will immediately put the patient on new per oral, and if the patient has eaten a meal within two hours, I will pass an gastric tube to empty the stomach content to prevent aspiration of stomach contents during surgery. When the patient is under the effects of general anesthesia, will, this will help continuous drainage of stomach content or aspiration or, de or decompression in other words. Uh, then apart from that, you say the nasogastric tube is lay, will be left in situ for continuous drainage, which I've mentioned, and also intravenous fluids can be given using the, uh, in, using the 
the nasogastric tube to prevent electrolyte imbalance and shock. And then afterwards, you move on to bladder preparation. On bladder preparation, you say I will insert, I will catheterize the patient to prevent urine retention during uh, operation. A full bladder may interfere with a surgical procedure by making the site less accessible, and it may also increase the risk of accidental injury to the bladder wall. And uh, this, the, the catheterization may also help in preventing urine incontinence and also monitoring kidney function, which may be affected by general anesthesia. The next heading afterwards will be bowel preparation. So here you say, if ordered and necessary, I will administer enema to cleanse the colon of fecal material. Bowel preparation helps to reduce the possible uh, fecal incontinence during surgery as the muscles will be paralyzed by anesthesia and contaminate and may contaminate the surgical field. From there, you move on to skin preparation. So on skin preparation, uh, here you are going to say, I'll, uh, this, since this is an emergency, I will quickly wipe the skin with antiseptic solution and shave the patient or trim the hair, uh, uh, trim the hair from uh, the nipple line to the mid thigh to remove hair because it may harbor microorganisms. Then afterwards, you move on to the next setting, which is pre-medication. Here you will say I would administer the following drugs. The first one is atropine 0 0.6 milligrams IM or IV to reduce overproduction of body secretions. Promethazine 12.5 milligrams to control nausea and vomiting induced by general anesthesia and also diazepam 15 milligrams IM or IV to relax muscles and also calm the patient. Afterwards, then you move on to uh, patient identification. Here you say I will give an identity band containing the patient's details, name, age, diagnosis, type of operation, type of anesthesia, and this is done to prevent surgical errors. Afterwards, then you move on to remove of jewelry and other items. Here you say I will remove the following dentures to prevent choking, glasses, artificial lenses, and also uh, jewelry. Uh, which may cause electric shock where a diathermy machine is used, and also nail polish since it can mask cyanosis. After patient died, after removal of jewelry, you move on to the next heading, which is gowning. And on gowning, you said before the patient goes to theater, I'll provide a clean gown as this will reduce chances of infection or transform of infection from the ward to them theater and for easy accessible for the operation site. Then from here, you, your next setting will be patient transfer to theater. You just say, I'll, I'll take the patient to theater with the patient file, which contains everything like TPRs, nurses notes, doctor's notes, and everything. Then afterwards, you say, I'll the next heading will be post-operative bed. So here you just say, upon return from theater, I'll make a post-operative bed and a tray in readiness for the patient after surgery. I will assemble all the emergency equipment and drugs on the, uh, on the acute bed. Then the last heading will be, as usual, communication to the family, where you communicate to the family that the relative has, has been now taken to theater and you will inform them when they are ready to see their relative. So that's how this question, in terms of management, that's how this management should be answered. And this is going to be similar to any management for uh, surgery, as long as that management is an emergence. So uh, you can even apply the way I've answered this one, even to other surgical conditions that you may face or experience. Then question D says, outline any five complications of abdominal surgery, which is the last question on this scenario. So the first one could be hemorrhage, and hemorrhage can be due to poor ligation, and then the patient ends up 
bleeding. So this can be prevented uh, by doing post-operative investigations nice where you take note of uh, if the patient has any disorders in terms of clotting of blood and also properly like getting the, the blood vessels. Wound infection is another post-op complication and this can result from wound contamination during and after surgery which results in invasion and growth of pathogenic bacteria on the incision or wound. Then also wound gapping or dehiscence is another complication that can occur. Dehiscence is just the separation of edges of the incision caused by the excessive strain on the wound. And this is caused by prolonged abdominal distension and also constipation uh, not support by where the patient is not even supporting the site of incision during maybe coughing, deep breathing, or exercises and also maybe doing ambulation. Evisceration is another complication that can occur and evisceration is the separation of all the tissue layers, which is the skin, the fascia and the peritoneum in an abdominal wound and the protrusion of a loop of the intestine onto the surface may occur in evisceration. So evisceration is usually, this one is usually sudden and the patient experiences um, a, a warm sensation on the skin surface due to escape of peritoneal fluids. The other complication is incision or hernia and this is caused by a weakness in abdominal wall which leads to protrusion of abdominal cavity content when there is sustained increase in intra-abdominal pressure. Deep vein thrombosis can also occur, and this is just formation of blood clots in the deep veins of the lower limbs. And it, it is, and this one occurs due to prolonged immobility or delayed ambulation and also lack of exercises post operatively. So those are some of the complications that can occur. And the last question also said outline any five complications of abdominal surgery, meaning you also need to give reasons just as I've given reasons. Thank you so much for taking time to go, to go through this tutorial. Be sure to read the notes and also ask questions where it is not clear.